Well, I'd like to thank all of the people who made all these generous uh, aspects of this introduction. <coughs> I hope the, le the lecture can live up to it. Um, okay, why don't we just launch into this. So I call this talk DNA not merely the secret of life. And what, we're, what that means is we're going to use DNA's chemical information. The key word here is information for bottom-up nanoscale control of the structure of matter by which we mean just putting what you want where you want it in three dimensions and when you want it there in time uh, so as to be able to control, uh, increase our control at the nano uh, scale. So probably everybody who went to kindergarten after about 1965 or so is familiar with this. Some who, like myself, didn't make that cut so let me just review the molecule uh, briefly. Uh, I, I think everybody knows that DNA is double helix. So we have the red helix here and the white helix here. And it's clear that DNA is a nanoscale object. Its diameter is about 2 nanometers, 20 angstroms. And its helical repeat is about 3.5 nanometers, consisting of 10 or 10.5 uh, individual units. Now, if you look closely at this guy, you see that the two strands are pointing in opposite directions. So here's a little pentagon over here, this white thing. And on the other side, there's another pentagon. Now, this guy's pointing down, but that one's pointing up. And that's true in general for the, for the DNA molecule. We call this form, which has you know, become sort of a cultural icon, B-DNA, where the bases are perpendicular to the helix axis. Uh, the business end of this molecule, we're just looking at edge on over here, but you can see it in, de in chemical detail, at any rate, over on the uh, right, where we have the famous Watson-Crick base pairs. So there's a big molecule we call A, and a small molecule we call T, and they're joined by two hydrogen bonds, indicated by these little red arrows. And then there's a second one called G, and uh, a big one, and a small one called C, and they're actually connected by three hydrogen bonds. And we're going to assume tonight that if the DNA molecules that we deal with can put an A opposite a T and a G opposite C to form a double helical structure, that that's going to happen. Okay. In order to understand what's important here, I wanted to mention uh, Alexander Rich's uh, in key contribution as far as I'm concerned. As, as Matt mentioned earlier, uh, I was a postdoc in Alex's lab, but long before I ever got there, he invented a process known as hybridization, where basically he took two strands, in this case of RNA, and put them together to form a double helix in solution. But this little red paragraph that I'm putting together here uh, shows that uh, he says, you know, he'd like to point out that, that this method of mixing two uh, strands can actually be used for a variety of studies. Now, what we're going to do tonight is work with more than two strands. But this was all started by Alex uh, in 1956, Alex and David Davies' paper. Uh, so this is the uh, DNA double helix again. It's what I just showed you. Now we see it sort of rotating around so you can get a kind of movie-like feel for it. But you know, if I wanted to really make something interesting out of this molecule, I'd have a problem. And the problem is that the helix axis is linear. Now, by linear, I don't mean uh, a straight line in the geometrical sense, but rather in the topological sense of that it's unbranched. It's just a line. You put two lines together, you get a longer line. If, you if it's a little bit floppy, maybe you can make a circle, or really floppy, you can make a knot or catenanes, but basically you can't really uh, make anything that I regard as really uh, interesting. In order to solve that problem, we went to biology and we stole something. All right, the thing we stole, that's why I call this a biocleptic tool, is <laughs> the process of reciprocal exchange. So here I got a blue strand and a red strand, and following reciprocal exchange, I have a red-blue strand and a blue-red strand. And this allows us to do lots of stuff. Uh, and let's put this now in a double helical context. And we can see that if I do that operation at this 
point right here and color the strands I've done it to green, you can see that, in fact, we have a green strand starting there. And then it crosses over to the other side. It comes down like this, and the other one forms the other side of that sort of X-like thing. But remember, I told you that the two helices actually have, d uh, you know, the, the two strands of the helix actually have mixed polarities. So, in fact, here you can do it between strands of opposite polarity rather than the same polarity as we did it over here. And now our green strand starts at the top, comes across, and comes back up. And the other one goes back down. It's sort of like a U-shaped structure. Now, these are, in fact, exactly the same molecule if we only do the operation once. Later, we'll see we make new molecules if we do the operation more than once. It's easier to think about those molecules I just showed you if we draw them like an intersection in a highway. Okay, so here we've got a bunch of base pairs. And you can see that we've, in fact, got uh, eight of these base pairs going this way, that way, that way, and that way. Each of these strands is a 16-mer. Let's not worry about all the little boxes here. That just has to do with the algorithm for designing sequences. Uh, not only can you make a forearm junction, like an ordinary highway intersection, but you can make others. Uh, in 1991, Yinli Wong in my lab reported five-arm junctions and six-arm junctions. And in 2007, uh, Xing Wang uh, reported a, an eight-arm junction and a 12-arm junction from the lab. So you can make all sorts of different uh, molecules that way. The purpose of uh, this one was to point out that around 1980, there were already existed this uh, way of doing things, namely what was called sticky-ended cohesion which is a programmable affinity between two pieces of DNA. So I've unwound the DNA here just to show the sequence. But you notice this strand is a little longer than this strand, and this strand on the bottom is a little longer than the one on the top over on this side. But in fact, these two sequences are complementary. And if you put these guys together in a pot uh, in the right conditions, they'll come together and join to make a single molecular entity. If you want, you can ligate them. That's not so important. Uh, the other aspect of this is that in addition to having this affinity that we've just discussed, you also have structure. This is the crystal structure that Hang Sha Chu in my laboratory reported not quite 20 years ago. And it consists of a decamer of DNA that forms an infinite helix in this direction, the horizontal direction, but it's, it's held together by sticky ends. So we can see there's a little gap here and a little gap there because we have those sticky ends holding this thing together. There'll be more out here and out there. But the important thing about this slide is that the structure, the 3D structure over here in the blue box is just like the structure over here in the red box, although it's upside down because it's only a half turn away. So what that means is if I know the coordinates of these atoms, I know the coordinates of these atoms I can uh, over here. And of course, in the crystal, I, I know them all the way. But in solution, I know them at least locally. So that's very potent. We know not only that something likes to talk to something else, but we know what it looks like a priori when it does do that talking. And that's very potent. Uh, so the, combining these two notions of branch DNA and sticky ends, I can make, put together four of these guys in principle and make a little object, a little quadrilateral. But you see, I've got a whole bunch of these sticky ends on the outside, so I could extend this thing, not just making objects, but also making lattices. Later, we'll talk about devices. But at any rate, you can get, see that this is a way for me to approach my crystallization problem. So for our laboratory, the things that we're mostly interested in are structure, uh, approaching the macromolecular crystallization problem, uh, some control of uh, polymer materials. Uh, we do do DNA-based computation and nanoelectronics organization. I won't talk much about that tonight, a little bit. And in terms of motion, we're interested in nanorobotics and nanofabrication. And I won't talk about our attempts at biomimesis with self-replication and selection evolution. That's for another night. Uh, so crystallography is one of the most sophisticated analytical tools out there. And this is how we all crystallize things. We guess conditions. We set up our crystals. Those so inclined might go through the middle step. 
And then we go on and look to see if we examine our setups and see if we have crystals. If we do, we can go off and do crystallography. Anybody goes to my website, they'll see this is actually the second version of this, talk, of this uh, slide. Because in the first one, I forgot this branch existed. <laughs> and which means, you know, you, you have to do something else. So you can either go through the inner box here or the outer box. But there's sort of minimal feedback as to what you did wrong here to what you should do the next time around. It's just total guesswork. So our suggestion is to do something a little different, to take a box, such as this magenta box. This is supposed to be made out of DNA. And the little things sticking out are the sticky ends. And just stick the boxes together to make your crystal. And then if you have your guests ordered on the inside, they too will diffract. Now, we have made the boxes. I'll tell you about that tonight. We're just getting ready to start putting things inside the boxes. We haven't quite done that yet. Uh, but if you can imagine organizing biological macromolecules, like that kidney bean-shaped thing I just showed you, you can also imagine organizing nanoelectronics. So here's a couple of junctions. These are sticky ends. And pendant from them is something that would actually behave like a nanowire. And the idea is organizing them using DNA. This is a notion that Bruce Robinson and I came up with not quite 30 years ago. And uh, we're still working on that. You may see some of that. So let's talk a little bit about some of the experiments we've done. The first things that we made were polyhedral catenanes. The very first thing was a cube-like uh, molecule. And basically, there are six different colored strands, each of which corresponds to a face of the cube. But the strands are all linked to the uh, faces that correspond to adjacent faces. Uh, and here is a truncated octahedron, so that's 14 uh, strands rather than uh, 6. Uh, but both this one and the cube, we're, these are just idealized structures. We weren't actually able to characterize them because the, the branch junction itself is kind of uh, floppy. So we're going to go on to other motifs that will actually give us geometrical control, real XYZ control. And the first thing we're going to do is try to construct crystalline arrays for beginning in two dimensions. So if you're going to make a component that's going to form a lattice, well, then you need three things. You need predictable interactions, and we did that with sticky ends. And we need predictable local product structures. That's also available from sticky ends. We both know about that now. But in addition, you need structural integrity, which is a fancy way of saying this stuff has to be relatively stiff. So the way we solved this problem was to go back to our protocol for making new motifs but now we're going to put on two exchanges instead of one. And when we do that, already you'll see that now there's actually a difference between the opposite polarities and the identical polarities. But we're going to put two helices together. And we're going to do this twice. So it's two reciprocal exchanges and on every step here. And we call these DXs. Don't worry about that. That doesn't mean much. Uh, but we're holding together these helices with two crossovers. And that's a pretty robust motif. This, these are more robust. So actually, we work below the line in most cases. So here we have five strands, whereas up here we had four. And we can keep ex extending this. Here's another uh, helix we can tack on. So we can make what we call DX and TX and much larger things as well. Uh, so this is how we're going to make robust uh, motifs. And here's an example of, two, of 2D DX arrays. This is work we did collaboratively with Eric Winfrey of Caltech. Farang Liu and Lisa Wensler from my laboratory uh, did the following experiment where they took an ordinary DX and another DX that had another DNA domain point sticking out of the screen at you. So that if you put these guys together to form a 2D arrangement, then in fact you get stripes from this extra domain. And the dimension in the horizontal direction here is 16 nanometers, meaning that the stripes should be about 32 nanometers apart. And if we look at the, in the atomic force microscope, which is a way that we can actually look at these things pretty readily, we see that we've got a striped array here. And if we measure the spacing here, it turns out to be about 32 nanometers. Now, there's a basic rule of looking for something in a microscope. If you go looking for it, you're going to find it. doesn't matter what kind of microscope it is. So what you have to do is run a control. Here's our control here, where we have four different tiles of the same dimension. 
but only one of them has this extension on it, so that we should see something like a 64 nanometer stripe, and indeed, that's what we see in this uh, example. So here's an example of a, what we're, where we're going with this, namely designing 3D crystals, work done by a lot of people in my laboratory, Jinping Sheng, Yan Perktoff, Yi Chen of Purdue, who was Chengdu Mao's student, Chengdu used to be my student, but he moved to Purdue. Uh, Tong Wang, Ruji Shan, Pam Constantino from my lab, and Steve Janelle at Oregon, and we collected our data both at Brookhaven and, and at Oregon. And uh, the motif we actually wound up using was invented by Chengdu's laboratory, and it's a sort of over under, over under, over under motif. Now, this should lead to a sort of rhombohedral symmetry. A rhombohedron is a cube where you've squashed or extended a body diagonal. So it's related to a cube, just depends on the structure. And indeed, you know, you put these guys together, you get the predicted cell edges. This is an X-ray diffraction pattern. And you get rhombohedral symmetry. This is that same motif taken in a picture uh, by Cheng De Mao uh, that he got when he was jogging at dawn. I think probably this one preceded this, that one. Uh, you know it was Cheng De who took the picture because I just said two words that don't describe me, A, jogging, and B, dawn. Uh, <laughs> so you can see the over, under, over, under, over, under uh, type of, uh, uh, of arrangement, and that's what our, our DNA triangles look like. Now, for me, this is arguably the most exciting slide that I've ever shown to an audience. These are macroscopic crystals. You can see them with your naked eyes. So we start off with little things on the nanoscale. We self-assembled them into things that you can see uh, with your naked eyes. We can actually make them bigger than this. And for diffraction purposes, we don't do that. But this, th this is 200 microns. So there's a little scale bar down here like that, too. This is about three, 400 microns on the diagonals. And we knew where all the atoms were in these crystals without actually doing the crystal structure. However, I'm an honest crystallographer, so we went through and iodinated this stuff and saw the structure in an unbiased fashion. And this is what that two-turn triangle looks like. So this is uh, closer to us. This is in the plane of the screen. Over there, it's behind. But then this stuff's in front again. And we go around the clock that way. Uh, this slide just shows, this is a four angst in resolution. And this shows that, that the contact from triangle to triangle is, in fact, the sticky end shown here. Now, to get some sense of what this structure looks like, I'm showing the environment of a single triangle. So we look at this triangle in the middle, and if we just follow these different helices, the red one goes from the rear to the front like this, the green one goes from the rear to the front like this, and the yellow one does the same thing. So this triangle is connected to six other triangles around it, and you can see that we're really covering all of three-dimensional space with this arrangement of DNA. And this wasn't a lucky punch. We've been able to make it, these things with two turns, three turns, four turns on an edge. Uh, we have both with, with the symmetry and without. And we're working on the problem that as the size gets, goes up, the resolution goes down, and we don't quite know what to do yet about that. This movie g shows the four-turn uh, triangle. It's the most photogenic one we have. And you can see how that triangle is flopping around here. And then how we're going to add three close to us, those three closer to us yet. And this one's in the front. And we can see how this guy uh, floats around. You can see how we have a rhombohedron floating around on the screen. And it does uh, fulfill all the uh, criteria that we want. And of course, remember, this is only eight molecules. In our crystal, we have 50 trillion. So it's a much bigger thing that we uh, ultimately wound up making. And we can put more than that in the crystal if we want. Uh, one of the nice things about what we do by controlling our contacts is that we can actually put more molecules in the crystallographic repeat. So here's a gr an each edge here has a green and a red triangle on, on it. And it's a little better here with the space filling. But you can see here's a red one, here's a green one, here's a red one, here's a green one. And you can see that it's actually two intersecting 
a tetrahedra that form this rhombohedra. They're not regular tetrahedra because it's a rhombohedra and not a cube. Uh, but using this system, uh, Ruji Shah was actually able to put some dyes in there and control one macroscopic property of the crystals. Uh, so he took a pink dye, CY3, and put it on uh, the A molecule, the B molecule, or both, and we get a pink crystal. He did the same thing with a blue dye, CY5, and we get blue crystals. And then in either order, he can put one red dye and one blue dye on here, and we can make uh, purple crystals. So we're starting to get to the point of controlling features of our crystals. And we can use this scheme to organize other materials. Here, Ji Wenjiang uh, organized 5 and 10 nanometer gold nanoparticles. This was uh, also involved with Pam Constantino, Christine Michael, who was in Palo Alto Salsa lab at the time, and Rick Keel when he was in Minnesota. So this is that same triangle that we've been talking about, but now each edge is one of these DX molecules. And it's big now. This is about eight turns. And what we've done is we've taken these uh, nanoparticles and we've put a single strand of DNA on them. And then that's an inherent component of our triangle. So we'll propagate this guy in the, this direction, propagate him in this direction, and just let this nanoparticle sit in there uh, on, the on the structure. So here, this is the two triangle arrangement. So we have this sort of red, magenta, blue triangle and the green, cyan, brown triangle. And then down here, you can see there's a 5 nanometer particle here, a 10 nanometer particle there. And we should get a kind of checkerboard pattern in the schematic. And indeed, when we look in the t tra uh, transmission EM, you can see that we have a, a, a checkerboard pattern of uh, 10 nanometer and 5 nanometer particles, the big ones and the little ones. Uh, recently in the lab, Yui Zhao, along with uh, Chris Ackerson of Colorado State, State, who's given us the right molecules, has been able to put small gold nanoparticles in 3D. So we can now organize nanoparticles in three dimensions. So far, we, we've just put one in. Here's a little gold 25 particle that Chris came up with. And it just goes on an extension of this inner strand. and this shows you that we actually have the, this is a, anomalous uh, scattering. That just means we see the metal. And we can see these three uh, blobs here in, uh, in, in our crystal that correspond to the gold nanoparticle. And now I want to move on a little bit to going from genes to machines, talking about devices that are going to allow us to uh, give, do things on the nanoscale. And the first device we made was made by Chengdu Mao when he was still in my lab, just at the tail end of the cent last century, uh, where he took a DX, and he took another DX, and he connected them with a piece of DNA that can undergo a transition known as the BZ transition. So ZDNA, which was, by the way, also discovered by Alexander Rich, uh, is a left-handed form of DNA. Uh, it's just a different conformation. And you can induce it by adding cobalt hexamine to your pot. And when you do that, uh, this little section turns into this other shape. You can see it's not BDNA like all the rest of it. And when that happens, this goes around about three and a half times, and we live on that uh, uh, modulus, so that, in fact, this domain is now goes from the bottom to the top. And we can measure that by uh, fluorescence resonance energy transfer. And I don't really like this device. It's the first one we could think of, but I don't like it because it doesn't use the programmability of DNA, which is, of course, the main thing that we want to do. So uh, Hao Yan, a couple years later, was able to build a sequence-dependent device. So to understand that, you have to, we have to understand another motif, uh, which we call PX DNA. And over here, we're, now we're going to be on the top half of the slide. Wherever one of these guys points at one of these, we're going to do, make a crossover there. And we're going to make this stuff we call PXDNA. If we look at this, top is AB, bottom is CD. If we get rid of a couple of these crossovers, 
Then we have only a single turn. So in fact, it's AB on top, but DC on the bottom. So it's a half turn difference between the two motifs. And the question is, how do we turn one into the other? And the answer is we break this red strand over here and put in the green strand. We break the blue strand over here and put in this green strand. And then if we can get the green strand out of here and put the yellow strand in, then we can do that. Well, these little horizontal uh, bits are actually just pieces of DNA sticking out into the pot. So the, they just allow us to get these out of here. The way it works is we add the whole complement to this green strand, the whole complement to this green strand, and it'll sit down over here. And sooner or later, by a process known as branch migration, it'll pull out the rest of the green strand. So we start here are our complements, and then we pull out the other green strands sitting there. So we have a naked frame at the top to which we can then add the yellow strand. And we can do the same thing over here and go back to the green. So that's if that were to work, that looks pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, what Howe did to show this by AFM was to take these devices and attach to them a half hexagon trapezoid. That he, he happened to have that in the freezer. And he connected these guys together, and in the green strand state, they're all pointing parallel. And in the yellow strand state, we have a zigzag arrangement. So uh, if we look in the AFM, we can see on successive cycles, we have parallel and zigzag, parallel and zigzag. So in fact, the device works this way. The reason we really like this device is that we're able to have a whole bunch of them in the pot and use them, address them individually. So just to move on for a second, here's a walking bipad uh, that was made by Bill Sherman and designed by Bill as well. And this thing walks like an inchworm, all right? So here's an inchworm. Here is the front foot. Here's the back foot. Uh, it can walk in either direction, but the front foot's always ahead of the back foot in either going this way or if once it goes this way. And this is our uh, bipad walker. There are two double helices here and a flexible connection. And then we use the same chemistry we just used. Uh, it was, by the way, developed by Bernard Yerke. Uh, to pull these strands out and pull these guys in. So this guy can walk on a little uh, TX uh, sidewalk and it can walk in either direction just like the inchworm. So we're going to combine a bunch of components here. We're going to program these uh, switches, these PXJX switches I showed you, a walker, uh, nanoparticles, and something called DNA origami, which is a really big piece of DNA. Uh, and what we're going to talk about making is a proximity-based programmable nanoscale assembly line built by Hangzhou Gu and Ji Zhou in my lab. And Ji was associated with Xiaoyan and Xiao. Here we have three loading stations uh, that can load cargo one, cargo two, and cargo three. And these guys are all pointed away from this arrangement here. And this is the chassis and the walker. This guy's going to somersault his way around here, you'll see. So in the first step, we're going to turn this guy from off to on. Now, when he's in proximity to the uh, chassis, the transfer will take place. And then we can take a half step and a whole step and wind up in the second station. So we're down to here now, and then we're going to change the state of this guy. And then this cargo will be added uh, as well. And we'll take a half step and a whole step and go down to being under the third station. And then uh, we'll change the state of this guy and we'll add the third cargo to it. So we just have one big glob now. So we can do that. Uh, this is the walker that we've got now. And it's got, for picking up the cargo, it's got three hands, H1, H2, and H3. And it's got th three feet for walking, F1, F2, and F3. And it's got a fourth foot that kind of ties it close to the cargo. Uh, this is another picture of the same thing. Uh, this just shows how the cargo transfer happens. When this guy is near, uh, when we flip this guy from pointing out there to pointing down here, then this single strand will bind down over here and it'll displace the other one so that this is now attached over here. There's more base pairs in this place than there are, uh, than there are over here and more base pairs here than there are over there. And we're driven by increased base pairing. 
Uh, this just shows that depending on how we program it, there are eight different products that we can make, everywhere from adding nothing to adding the three things I told you in detail, or various combinations of two cargos, or various single car uh, cargos. Uh, we now have a 3D device, and the way this works is it's, it, we're in our crystal. I don't know if you can, how well you can see it, but this is a colorless crystal here. We've extended that central strand, so now it can pair with something. And the something you compare with is this strand that's bearing a red dye. So when we add that to the crystal, then the crystal goes from colorless to red. And then we can displace that strand if we want to, and then we can uh, put in a strand bearing a blue dye, the CY5, and it, uh, the crystal turns blue. And we can cycle this about three or four times at least. Uh, this just shows the electron density. This is I mean, the crystallographer and me looking for this stuff. So here we have a, a certain amount of density over here, a little bit more over here in our difference map. This just tells us that it's all really there, and it's not just sort of some, a phenomenon that's happening there. Uh, this is the other state. It's the same picture. Uh, and then I want to talk about la one last thing. Uh, it's been done in collaboration with my colleague Jim Canary, uh, Xiao Wang, his student, and Ruchi Shaw from my lab have assembled PANI crystals. So PANI is polyaniline. It's a semiconductor. And there are four states to polyaniline. Uh, normally, it, because it's out in, just in, in the air, it's blue. It's called the emeraldine base. This is an octamer of the aniline subunit. If you lower the pH, it turns green. It's called the emeraldine salt. If you oxidize it, it turns pink. That's called pernigranulin. And if you reduce that, it becomes colorless. And this is called leucoemeraldine. Uh, and we can, we've got these guys in the crystals. We, what we've done is we, instead of crystallizing a single triangle, we've crystallized an edge. And then we can see over here, here's the green crystal, the blue crystal, the uh, pink crystal, and the colorless crystal. It's all the same crystal that we're looking at. And we can just, by changing conditions, can convert our guest molecule there. So to summarize what we've done, we've made polyhedral catenanes. I didn't talk about knots and bromine rings. We've made those too from branch DNA by ligating them. 2D lattices with tunable features have been made from DNA tiles. I didn't talk about origami. 3D crystals with tunable properties have been self-assembled and the structure has been determined. Heterologous species can be organized by DNA both in two and three dimensions. And uh, nanomechanical devices have been assembled by, from branch DNA, including the shapeshifter and a walker. And these have been combined on an origami surface to produce a nanoscale assembly line and within a crystal to produce a 3D device. So here's my web page. It's not quite up to date, but probably close enough. You can reach me there if there's something else you want to know. And I'll be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you.